bringing you in-depth discussion from one of the rad groups of online writers covering the Edmonton Oilers. Are you ready for Oilers Overtime? Oilers. Join us as we talk news, rumors, trades, player grades, game results, and more. All featured on one of the most glorified teams in the NHL. From the great one to the next one. From the boys on the bus to the decade of darkness. This is Oilers Overtime. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of THW Oilers Overtime. My name is Jim Parsons. Uh, we got lots to talk about when it comes to Edmonton Oilers, and we do it every week. We don't always have the full cast of characters, and we're minus Colton. Thank you tonight, but we do have Julian Mongila with us. Julian, how are you? Um, suffering from a tough loss that the Leafs uh, just took to the Arizona Coyotes, but uh, other than that, Oilers are doing coming off a big win, so I'm good that way. What is it with Arizona always having a game know. against Toronto? Wait, wait uh, a second here. The 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 Leafs just lost to the Coyotes in Toronto. Yep. Really? Yep. Wow. Okay, yep. I didn't see that. <laughs> they're just they're they're. It's like a marketing effort for us and Matthews, right? Like, isn't that what it is? Yep. It's like a, it's like a pitch. It's like a brochure, but on hey, the we X, beat you every time. It. Just come to the dark. Yeah, side. you know you're trying really to do. Be, right? I know. I know. That's the deal, right? And of course, Brian Swain is with us as well. Brian, how are you? <laughs> I'm 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 good. I'm good. Thanks. He's like, I'm better now that I heard the Toronto news. No, just <laughs> That's just no. I mean, hey, we, anyone in Edmonton is in no position to, th- you know, those okay, yeah. those who live in glass houses shall not throw stones, <laughs> right? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, uh, that's one of the things that has happened here since last week and recent weeks uh, with the Oilers is that at this point, the Edmonton is not even a playoff team. I mean, they're close. They're right on the bubble. They're on the verge, a win here, two wins in a row, gets them right back in the conversation. And they're certainly not out of it, but uh, they are not by any stretch a lock. Now they played against Washington and ended up winning in overtime, which is good. That's actually two really close games against the Capitals, a really good team, one in which the Oilers came back and won. And then this time they won in overtime, a uh, big one, but they got Tampa Bay on the dock uh, tonight as people watch this video. Uh, what do you think, Julian? What, what about this Oilers team? is either A, super frustrating because they're not quite in it, or B, kind of positive that they're still hanging in there and playing some pretty good hockey teams. Well, I mean, they've shown they're pretty resilient lately. They've been able to hang around games, being banged up, uh, having to shuffle lines and, and fit people in different different places that they might not normally play and the minutes they might not normally play. So I think that given the hand they're dealt, they're doing a pretty good job. Koskinen's kind of been they're saving grace you could say in the net and giving some stability actually. Um, and, and I think that, that the, the flow of the game is, is coming to him a little bit more easier now. Um, but I mean, for, for what, for the hand they're dealt, they, they're doing an extremely good job. And I think that they're, you know, they're playing some tough teams and, and showing that they can hang in there. Um, the big guys are starting, the big guns are starting to, to come out and out of their shell after been being kind of quiet for, uh, for the last few weeks. So um, hopefully they can keep it going and 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 power the power the rest of the team through. Yeah, it's interesting because they're they're starting to play a little bit better five on five, but their special teams where they were really really strong at the beginning of the season they're and kind of got them through and opening. Away. They were one of the hottest teams in the NHL. It has been awful of late. Mm-hmm. Like their penalty kill has been bad. The power play is mediocre at best at this point, considering they were at one point fifty percent on their power play at the season, which was un. Mm-hmm heard of uh they're not anywhere near that mark nobody expected them to stay there but it's been pretty ugly uh brian what do you think like is this a concerning issue for edmonton that they're out on the outside looking in but they're still hanging in there well it's i think it's going to be tense uh run down the stretch here these last what is it 25 games 24 games i think uh it's yeah it's it's going to be tense you, this is not the position you want it to be in this is probably not the position you thought you'd be in when you started 16 and 5 um, but I feel a lot better about this team after what I saw in the Washington game. Um, mm-hmm. if we'd recorded this on the normal night we do, which is Tuesday, which was following the, the flames game. I mean, I, I, and I, I was talking to buddies after that game and I just texted them and I said that this is not a playoff team right now. Um, and you know, I think there's, there's still, this is a deeply flawed team. Uh, in spite of what we saw last night with the wins that, you know, this, the, this is a deeply flawed team. That's not going to be fixed simply by guys coming back from injury. There's not a trade out there that can solve this, you know? Um, so I think it's just the, 
the hard truth that a lot of people have to face that this this is who the Oilers are and and they're going to be in there they're going to be in into the you know in the mix, the mix right down to the stretch but I don't think you're you're going to be like if you clinch it's probably going to be with two three four games left and most so let me ask you this to to expound on the idea that you said this is a deeply flawed team I'm not saying I disagree with you but I do want to ask this question are they deeply flawed or are they just flawed a little bit because uh, let me argue this there hasn't been much of a point this season when the roster as wanted to be constructed and wanted to be presented by Ken Holland has played together right like as soon as you get injuries back and they always play pretty well and they have their you know top nine the way they want it and their guys they play pretty well and then you get you know Evan Bouchard has a stomach illness Mike Smith can't seem to stay healthy Duncan Keith gets crashed into the boards and he's out for a couple weeks you lose Pugliarvi you lose Cassian you lose I mean, you name it, these guys are going down like crazy. Now, every team has injuries, so it's not exactly an excuse, so to speak. But does do you still believe the Oilers team is deeply flawed? Like, we know there are issues in goal, and we know maybe they'd like to be a little bit deeper on defense. But is it are are they not flawed in the way that they're constructed and made up that no matter how healthy they are, is still this is not a given that this team is a contender? Yeah, you make fair points, and deeply might be too strong of a word to use. What what I would say to that is all teams deal with injuries. A lot of them seem to be able to handle a lot better than the others do, and I think that's because when you take away those top pieces, other teams have the pieces to step in and, 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 and handle the situation. I also think that other teams have a culture and a leadership that – may be missing to some degree on the others that allows them to get through those hard times. So what – when I say DP, that might be too strong of a word, but in, in the sense that I think when you take away those top layers, they get exposed very quickly. Um, whereas championship teams just don't, they find a way to get through that because I don't think the others have dealt with, I, I don't think, I mean, they've had some difficult injuries to deal with. Yes. Um, and certainly right now with, with news and Puyarvi out and et cetera, but I, there's been a lot of good teams that are near the top of the standings that have had similar injury situations to deal with this year. Okay. That, that comment leads me to ask a good, it's a good transition for me to ask Julian the following question, because when you talk about the depth, not being able to step in there and maybe play well, or the culture or the, you know, the certain element that the Oilers might be missing. I felt they had some of that in Marcus Nimalainen. And here's a defenseman who stepped in. uh, He's, He's big, but he's not huge yet. He's still got lots of growth to him, but he hits everything that moves. Uh, He's a totally different player than the Oilers had. And they demoted him, but then they signed him. So they just recently signed him today. Julian, is this what Brian's talking about when you talk about how the Oilers necessarily don't handle these transitions well? You had a player who stepped in. Now he wasn't perfect, clearly. Uh, he's still young and learning and making mistakes and things like that. But he was pretty solid. Like, he was a good defense. And they put him back down in Bakersfield, and then they signed him. So the signing is great. I'm a little surprised, though, that they demoted him. What do you think about all this? Uh, you know me. I'm kind of the guy who likes to take the time, I guess, to see the guys develop and not rush them in. We said this. I said this about Skinner already. Um, but I like the move. I think. This is why they're, I wouldn't say they're, they're deeply flawed because it's, it's like, like Brian said, it's too strong of a word, but they're flawed in the fact that, you know, they, they're, they're, they're doing the right moves, but, but it's still not working. Like they're trying to put the right pieces in place, but it's just not for whatever reason is not clicking. Um, Because I think that they've done a good job getting the prospects that they want in the organization to do specific things. Um, and check different boxes like Nimalainen is a physical presence. Bouchard's a puck mover. Broberg's a puck mover. Then you got a little bit of grit. You know what I mean? Like they've done a lot to, 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 to check boxes m- minus the goaltending. That's a different story in itself, but they Holland has done his best to put the pieces he wants in place. So I think that for whatever reason that it's not working, maybe it is injuries or, or inconsistencies that um, kind of just pile on and that could be part of it. Um, and that that's part of the flaw really, but in terms of Nemo and I think it's, it's a smart move to bring him in to, to make the first year, um, a two way deal, be able to move him up and down because th- this next year is probably still going to be that transition period where you probably want to move a little bit of guys out to save some cap and then bring a couple guys in as well. Or maybe he does step up and, and prove, prove in the, uh, in training camp next season that he's good enough to stay here for the full season. Um, and, and, and by 
the, the year after that, he'll be up there full time is what looks like that they have the idea um, of whether he wants to, they want to be in the development. He's only had 44 games, I think at the AHL level and whatever experience at the NHL level. So he's still very green. And a lot of, like you said, a lot of room to grow still. So I like it. I like the signing. I like his game and I think he'll be here for a while. Brian, are you on board with the idea? I mean, Julian likes the signing and it sounds like he likes the fact that he's going back to the AHL to play a lot. Are you with him on that? Like do you one like the signing and two, like the fact that they put him back down there or I'm a little bit more leaning towards the fact that I thought Neiman Landon was playing well enough to have earned a spot, in fact, over a couple other people. Um, so I was kind of surprised that they moved him back down. I love the signing. Uh, I think it's going to be a huge win for them uh, in the next two years, and he could turn out to be quite a player. Um, but I was a little surprised that they put him back down there. Where do you sit with this? Yeah, I think you and I are in the same mindset on this. We talked about this in previous episodes of, of how we feel that he brings an element to this team that is simply not there, that nobody else has, period. And I think that's indisputable. Um, so to take that, so to see him come in, bring that element, see how positively it affects games, and then take it out, doesn't necessarily make sense to me. I, I, I'm also on board with Julian. Like, I understand uh, letting the guys develop and – the concern that maybe he'd be in over his head, but I haven't seen that so far. And this is, again, this is what we're seeing with Skinner, uh, a guy who's done every time he's been up, he's proven he can hang. He's played. He's been the best, at least statistically, um, been the best goalie in the organization this season. They need a goalie and they just stubbornly keep him down there. And I think that's part of it. This is, this is the attitude of Holland when, yeah, he's got the piece, but he's not putting the, the piece or the, the not putting the piece in a place to succeed and to help the team reach its goals. So, you know. Julian, do you agree that Holland's maybe got the wrong attitude here? Like if Brian's right and he's, whether it's too stubborn or just feels like these players, he's got an agenda for them and he's not going to shift from that focus or what have you. Is he approaching some of these things wrong or do you think Holland's, and, and I'm going to lead into a mm-hmm. very obvious topic with the trade deadline next, but what do you think about the fact that that Holland's making these decisions. Do you agree with them? Yeah. I mean, like it's, he's in a tough spot. Like you're, you, you got to trust your NHLers to kind of pull through. Like you have to give them the benefit of the doubt, even if they aren't, aren't playing well, you know, like these are the guys you signed, you brought them in for a reason and, and you have to kind of trust the process of them either getting out of their funk or, you know, rewarding them when they play well. So like for me right now, clear on my mind is what's going on with the beliefs in Mrazic. Like they brought Mraz- they're in a goalie controversy on another level too right now. So Mrazic plays tonight, he gets lit up again. And the the backup emergency backup comes in and he stops all the all the shots he faced except the overtime winner. So, you know, right immediately, like it's it's like things pile on and then you sh- like the momentum constantly shifting. So you you the odds are you're going to go back to the guy you signed for a three-year deal to, to be your guy still in the net. Like you just cause one game, you know what I mean? So it's, it's not like you can't, you can't just give up on a guy like, you know, you, they have a, bu- a bunch of defensemen already on the blue line that are NHL ready. They know what they can get from them. And I think it's more important for, for Nemo to, to mature in a, in a culture where, you know, it's a winning culture down there in Bakersfield. They're a really good team. Um, and just kind of grow the pro game that way rather than, you know, in a fighting for minutes in, in a, you know, rotation of defensemen at the NHL level, even though, you know, it's, it's going to be, you're in and out of the lineup. So I'd rather see him get the consistent play. Yeah. I, the one thing I will say that's a little bit different for the Edmonton and Toronto situation is that this Toronto situation, Jack Campbell has been good all year, except for recently. And then now he's out for a couple of weeks. Um, but Holland's been making these calls for two to three seasons now, and he's been struggling with them. He's been getting into the first round, getting knocked out. He's had the chance to make the changes in goal three times, and he's not done it any three, any of those three times, yeah. which is what I think is frustrating the fans is that he knows it's not like it's just this last couple of months where he's like, Oh man, that player plays really well. Maybe we should <laughs> give him a shot. Like he's known that Koskinen and Smith are what they are. And I guess in some ways you can defend the fact that he was hoping they would both be healthy this year and you would get a different look than what you've gotten. But I mean, you got to know, right. Um, So let's, let's lead into this. So with that said, with his confidence and what he believes might be the really goalie tandem, or he's moving Nima line it down and he likes his defense. I mean, we know that he's made some upgrades. Um, Let's specifically get into uh, the NHL trade deadline. 
One, we're going to talk about a general idea of what is, this all means, being outside of the playoffs, what it's going to mean for the t- trade deadline. But then I want to talk about a specific goalie that there are rumors the Oilers went after. It didn't quite turn out. So, Brian, I'll start with you. Uh, what do you do in the situation for the trade deadline when you're three points out or one point out of you know, the wild card spot? You're still in it, but you're not like, are you going for it if you're Holland? Because we already know he's not going to trade a first. He's not going to trade any of his high end prospects. Uh, he's not spending a fortune to get players because he can't. He doesn't have the salary cap space. Uh, what do you do if you're Ken Holland and you're just now on the outside looking in, but you know you probably need just that little nudge in the right place to get you where you want to be? Yeah, well, I think you said it there. I mean, he's not – the pieces that he does have, he's not willing to move. Um Obviously, they're not going to be sellers. I don't think they're going to be big time buyers either because they don't necessarily have the, the commodities to acquire those those things. So, I mean, anyone who I think is expecting a big jolt to, at the trade deadline or a big addition, uh, it's it's not They'll coming. Be disappointed. Yeah, yeah. I think you know the the way I would almost look at this, and I know we'll get into the goalie situation here in a second. I'll just get my thoughts in on this real quick here. There, I, I don't think the goalie is out there either. Obviously, that's the one obvious thing. Maybe something that you do do is is make moves around the goal, around outside of the goal to, to maybe help make life easier for the goalies. So maybe that's bringing in a veteran defenseman. Maybe that, you know, other other pieces that can help help alleviate the situation in goal because you're not improving it. I mean, unless, and I hate to be the broken record, unless you call off Skinner, we're not going to see anything magically transform. Smith is not going to turn into, you know, like he's not, he's turning 40 next week. He's not, I like. Koskinen's I mean, Koskinen your starter, right? Like he's your starter. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. the way it is right now. He's your starter. Yeah. And so he's yeah, played played well, well and good for him, but we know who he is. And with Skinner, all we know is if they run with Skinner, it's a different look. We have no idea what the outcome will be. Right, and like that's, that's the beauty. We can't of it though, say right? for sure that Skinner's the right guy because his numbers look good, but they're AHL numbers. So we yeah. have no idea what he could do. All we know is if they run with it, it's a different look that the Oilers haven't tried yet. And so that's a whole different ball game, right? But I'm with you. Like, do you, Brian? Do you have a defenseman that you would target? So if you're looking at you know little pieces around your goalie, whether it's like a Justin Braun out of Philadelphia, or it's just like, do you have somebody that's kind of on your radar that you're thinking, you know what? Here's a guy that I think potentially could be out there and, and forget the fact that we're not going after Chikrin. We're probably not going after Josh Manson. We're probably not going after any of those big guys. Is there somebody out there that you're kind of like, you know what, that might work. Yeah. Nobody is specifically comes to mind. I mean, to be honest, I haven't perused through who might be outside of the big names. I, I don't know. I mean, this, this is going to be a minor addition, right? This is going to yeah. be a veteran that can, that, that can just give you that little bit more. And those kind of guys are always available at the deadline. Um, so I'm sure they're out there, but to be honest, yeah, I don't have anybody specifically in mind. Um, but whatever trade it's going to be, isn't, it's not going to be a blockbuster. Well, we'll uh, take a look at that in a future show. Cause we have, uh, you know, another, what, two weeks, uh, yeah. before the deadline and what are probably next week, we'll take a really deep dive into what the Oilers will do or should do or won't do, but we hope they would have, um, into the trade deadline. We'll do that <laughs> next week. Uh, yeah. Julian, what about you? Is there a, or a general tactic before we get into that show specifically yeah, so that you would kind of take? I wrote an article that said Oilers need to head into the trade deadline focusing on retooling the roster. That that was my take on what the strategy they should take heading into the trade deadline. And that to me entails leaving the goaltending situation as is. You're not going to address it because there's like Brian said, there's nobody good enough that you're going to bring in that's going to drastically change that. So you roll with what you have and readjust next year and you go find that. I don't know where he is. You go find a way to get a number one needs to be done. Whether that's free agency or trade, you figure it out. But at that point, you're prepping your moves. You have to like this retool needs to be a prep in order for them to go make these moves in the off season, whether that's shedding cap space, moving contracts out and stacking assets in order to use in a trade, you go find ways that you stack enough assets to make that retool in the off season. So I think what they should do is they're going to lose guys like Cassian. Let those, that guys, that a guy like Cassian is at his highest peak trade value in, in come playoff time. Teams want guys like that. So you, you could shed a $3.2 million cap hit right now and not, really sacrificing anything off your roster because you're really you already used you already went this long without him in the lineup 
whatever, six weeks. So use it as a retool. If you have to move Evander Kane, he has a no move, but if you could move him for some assets back and use that in a trade later, that's what you need to do. And it's always been in and out, dip your toe in the water in the trade deadline, get a couple of guys, but not anybody big enough ever to, to make a difference. And that's why they've been a mediocre result at the end of the end of the every, every playoff situation for the last couple of seasons now. So I think it's either you're in or you're out. And to me, it's, it's not that you're out, but it's you're moving assets out to you're moving pieces out to prep for next year while still maintaining a push with the internal candidates you have to fill those positions and still trying to push for the playoffs and get them those that experience and hope you can get hot enough to get on a run. Because like we said before, they're a flawed team and in the playoffs, if you do make trades to, to, to get some pieces in, you're really not going to go deep with the way they've been playing inconsistent. So you're not only, if I hear you right, you're not only saying the Oilers shouldn't add because they're not going to go far enough in the playoffs to make it worth it, but you're also suggesting that they get rid of some of the pieces they might have used in the playoffs, like Evander Kane, Zach Cassian, maybe Mike Smith. Maybe not Tyson all of them. Barry. Yeah, not all of them, but I think that some of them could go in order to figure out which guys you think are the core or that you want returning, whether and, and, and figure out which ones you want to move out. So it's kind of a unique flowing situation, but that's the way, like, I, I hate to see that, you know, last year, what did like the first year he was in and they added like Ennis and Athens CU, and it was a little minor moves that really didn't do much at the end. And they added Kulikov last year. That's the only move they made. And that didn't really do anything for them. Like it's either you're in or you're out. Like if, if you didn't go in last year, when you had the advantage of the North division and go and trade a first round pick to go get somebody that's going to really put you over the top, then, then what are they going to do this year? That's going to make a difference. It's an interesting strategy, you know, like because it, it, it's a tough decision, right? If you do that and something happens and you make the playoffs and then injuries strike you like they've been striking all season and you move a guy like Barry, you have no backup if a guy like Bouchard goes down. If you move a guy like Cassian, you get rid of a lot of physicality. If you move a guy like Evander Kane, you have no physicality and you're going to need it. It's an interesting strategy, you know, like it certainly won't sit well with a lot of people, but I'm not, I, I do understand where you're coming from a little bit. Uh, let's talk a bit about the goaltending, uh, Brian, here's the deal. So I guess the Oilers reached out to, uh, the Islanders about Simeon Varlamov and he's got 16 teams on his no trade list. So pretty much half the NHL. And he, from what we understand, two sources now have said that the Oilers did reach out. Don't know how far the conversations got. We don't know if there was actually a trade on the table. We don't know any of that. What we do know is it sounds like Varlamov is like, nah, not interested. And so it didn't really go very far. Um, so this kind of answers the question about one, what do they think about their goaltending Two, who are they kind of targeting? He might be the one guy we've talked about it a lot. There's nobody really out there. He might've been the one guy that was right. Like here, here's a goalie who is a little bit more expensive than the Oilers could probably afford, but he's got some pretty good numbers. Islanders were not asking for very much. It couldn't have been anything more than a second, maybe a third round pick for this guy. And they might've retained a little salary right, to just to move him and get rid of a contract and that sort of how is it a big deal that this didn't fall, that this kind of fell through for the Oilers? Um, well, I think, you know, it's another sign. The fact that he declined to, to waive his no trade to, to come to Edmonton or he exercised, I guess, as to say is no trade um, is interesting. Um, beyond that, I mean, I, I he was the one guy, as you mentioned, we talked about him. He was the one guy that maybe was even on the borderline of being a realistic trade that you could see bringing in and maybe making a difference and, you know, strike another one off the list, right? Like, just like pipe, Mark Andre Fleury was a pipe dream there for a while. And then that completely got blown this to bits. And now, and now, and now, you know, the, the hard, the cold, hard hand of reality comes down and strikes this deal aside too. And it's like, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're just sitting there with, with nothing but a future all-star in Bakersfield, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Julie? I mean, like I will, the one thing I will say is that, uh, and for I mean, Elliot Freeman pointed this out too, is that there's a lot of teams that might be interested in Verlamov, but not a, a, a number of them don't have the guts to ask right there. Cause they don't want to be shot down. Cause he's going to shoot down most of the trade offers. So in defense of the Oilers, it's not like he specifically was like, no, I don't want to go to Edmonton. I hate that. Play. Like, He's not saying that, or at least we don't think he's saying that. He's just simply saying, I, I'd rather not. I, there's other places I'd like to go um, if I have to go anywhere. Or maybe he doesn't want to go. Maybe he just is like, I don't want to leave. Like, it's just not. So is it, 
you know, good that the Oilers are at least putting themselves out there while it sucks that they were shot down and maybe it doesn't look great that they were shot down, but at least they're trying, they're putting themselves out there. So in a way, Holland, you can't say Holland's not giving it a shot anyway. Right. Yeah, no, he's making his, he's doing his due diligence. Right. And that's all you can ask for. Um, you know, trying to improve your team and, and, and ways that you think is flawed. I mean, it's going to be a, a tough situation just to find somebody that, like we said, to give him a big enough upgrade. And Varlamov was really that guy because of this cap hit that was going to work. But um, this is why this is why it's it's it, it to me it makes more sense that you have to go do that in the off season because the way how how close the standings are right now is is going and it's going to change a lot heading down to the stretch and all the way up to the probably the day before the deadline and and seeing where teams are and and who's in and who's out. Um, which, which means guys could become available at a later date, but right now, you know, check in on Varlamov and if you know, he's not going to come, then you can already turn. It's better to know now so that you can already turn your head and focus elsewhere. Right. You don't want to chase something and say, okay, we kind of have this on the back burner. Let's see where we can get to with what we have right now and make a decision close to the deadline. Right. Like it, it's, it's better to know that it's not going to happen and you can, and you can kind of look elsewhere, um, to address that and see where you're at. Uh, closer to the deadline to see if there's anything really you can kind of make a move on. Um, I still kind of like the Holpe situation. I think he's someone who could get hot if if they do end up um, wanting to add somebody and and proving that they're good enough to you know if they're in a playoff spot close enough to the time um, when the deadline comes that that warrants Holland being in there um, on a goalie. Then I think Holpe could be a good one. Yeah, that also depends on where Dallas is at, right? Like if Dallas is exactly. in this thing, he's not going anywhere, yeah. right? If they're out of it, then he probably will, right? Uh, it'll be interesting. Okay, let's do the plus one, minus one, but I want to I wanna do this a little more specifically than we normally do. So we had talked before we went on here about the line combinations and what we think the Oilers might do here moving forward and shuffling things around, and we're probably going to see a situation where pretty soon – Pooley coming back and some of these guys are going to be slotted. So uh, Brian, I'll start with you. If you had to pick a plus one minus one based on the way certain forwards or defensemen have been playing of late, who would you say has, has played really well and deserves a spot maybe in the top six or the top four of the Oilers defense or what have you, or who's played poorly enough to have worked them with themselves out of the equation. Is there a name that kind of stands out for you in these last couple of games? You're like, yeah, he's, he's really impressed or yeah, I think his opportunity in these spots is probably over. We're focusing just on the defense. No, it doesn't matter. No, Forward defense, whatever you want. Um, no one's really, I mean, everyone's kind of in where I think they should be right now for the most part. Uh, Warren Foles has been a bit of a disappointment, I think. Um, I usually like to go plus one, but just off the top of my head, that's the first one really that comes mm-hmm. to mind that maybe is playing in a position that's uh, above his pay grade or his ability I, anyway. I will admit, every time I see Warren Fogel and I see him working hard, I do feel bad that it isn't always paying off for him. Like he does a yeah. lot of stuff that he it's the goals aren't coming. And so when he does score, I like feel really good for him because I'm like, man, he, he works yeah. hard. Like he's he's kind of, but it just doesn't happen for him. And so he doesn't often get that look in the top six. And it is a little disappointing when he doesn't get those numbers because you're like, man, if he gets a couple goals here, the, the narrative around him changes, but it just, it doesn't happen for him very often. Right. So I, I, I get that for sure. Uh, Julian, is there somebody that you're kind of have been watching, have been noticing lately in the, in, you know, the positive or the negative? Uh, I I've like, I love, I've liked uh, Kyler Yamamoto's game uh, recently. It, it seems that like he's being effective, even if he's not getting points or putting points on the board. Um, and, and even if he's playing with McDavid or dry settle, it seems like he's, he's able to kind of flip flop now and, and just mm. play his own game. Like it's, it's like he found confidence in himself that he knows what he needs to go in and do. Um, you know, like we said a little bit, a little bit ago, you know, he's shooting the puck more, you know, and getting to the net. Um, and that's what he does best, right? He's a, he's a little pesky player and, um, if he can do that and skate hard, then he's going to be effective in, in any role, really, wherever they want to slot him. But um, unspecifically, my minus goes to the ref who didn't call the hook on Hyman for that. That's uh... brutal. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like, I don't know how that gets missed, right? Yeah. Like, it's just so blatant. I, is that, I don't know. Is that the Ovechkin factor? Like, it's the fact that he's the one. Do I, I, I just couldn't believe it, right? It's good they were, they were there's one, but still, like, to yeah. have to go to overtime and with, uh, you know, uh, the, it was a TG Oshi scored with like 0.8 one, seconds left. Yeah. Like, 
It's just crazy. Just insanely crazy. Um, my pick's going to go to Ryan McLeod. We mentioned him last week. Uh, I want to stick with him a little bit here too, because I, I watch him and I believe that he's actually like, he's legitimately working himself into the top six. Mm-hmm. Like he's been one of those players when no matter what you throw, whether Nugent Hopkins is going down or Pooley Irby going down or the, the lineups have changed. McLeod seems to like, look at the opportunity that's been given to him and elevate himself to play well in those situations. And he's played really well with dry saddle and McDavid when he's getting the opportunity, he's been playing well in the second unit power play. Like he's yep. been doing a lot and I see shorthanded wood. Wo- yeah. Sure. Woodcroft has given him inches here. Like every once in a while, he's given him a little more, he's given him a little more and the cloud is not wasting it. Like he's taking it and he's playing pretty well. Like anybody he's not been perfect, but like, he just seems like he's so fast and he's got some skill and he's just, he's getting better and better and better. I really like that. So I'm very curious to see what's going to happen. Like I, I believe when Pooley Irby comes back, he's right back in that top six again, playing with McDavid. When Nuja Hopkins comes back, I would assume he's probably going to be your third line center again, but you don't mm-hmm. really know. Uh, but I don't know where you put McLeod, right? Like I wonder if you stick him in the top six, Brian, what do you, you look like you're about to say? Yeah. That. Well, no, you, you brought it up there because I know like you're a big proponent of Pooley Irby and, but I agree with everything you're saying about yeah. McLeod. Uh, so I, I'm curious, like, what would you do? Pooley Irby could be back as soon as Saturday against Tampa, I think from what we're hearing. Right. So yeah. What, what do you do? I mean, I guess it's a nice problem to have. Um, yeah. But what I think at this point in time too, you, you, you also have to focus on what gives this team the best chance to win every night. This is not about giving McLeod like, like I agree with you. He's Woodcroft's given him a little bit more, a little bit more. We're seeing great progress and evolution in his game, but right now it's got to be about getting those two points every night more than anything yeah. else. I really I prob- like him on, I like him on the wing. Like I really yeah. like him on the wing. Cause he, cause he could skate so well. Um, but I think, you know, if Pooley RV is back, I think he's going to end up probably on the third line, but I'd still play him on the wing. Like let Ryan play center, um, and keep him on the wing and let him kind of create more. I, I would, I would agree. I would say the one thing I would add to that is that Woodcroft has got to be extremely flexible. Like if mm-hmm. you're going to move him down to the third line, which you probably will, because I think Pooley RV needs to be Pooley RV's he's going back up too yeah but i think he does the best when he plays with Connor mcdavid so yeah. i would put him there and i would also put mcleod on the third line but i would not i would make sure that ryan mcleod knows this is not a permanent spot for yeah. you like if you're going to be down here right now that does not mean you're staying here if there's opportunities for him to put you in the top six and there's you know coming off of shorthanded whatever or put i'm going to do it and i would do the same thing with Derek ryan and i would tell both of those guys that we might flip-flop you like, cause Derek Ryan played really well when he was mm-hmm. on the wing and it opened him up to getting real. And he was hot, like two, three games. He was the hottest oiler that there was. And I wonder if you put him back at center and then you put McLeod on, on the wing yeah. on that third line, if you're telling both of those guys, okay, we're going to put you back where we think you should be, but that kind of limits you. I would not limit these guys. That would absolutely, I think, cripple them in terms of what they could do. So I would say, yes, probably put them back in the third line, but I would make sure that they know, this is not a permanent spot for you. If you play well in a game, you're going to be in that top six. If Derek Ryan, if you're playing well on wing, I'm going to keep you on wing. Like I yep. just, I would absolutely leave it wide open to whatever happens in the flow of a game. Cause I think they both earned it. I think they both played really well yep. in that way. All right. Uh, let's make a prediction. Uh, I think as people watch this, they're going to be uh, getting ready for the Tampa Bay game. So they played pretty well against Tampa last time. They didn't get the win, but they played pretty well. Uh, Julian, what do you think is going to happen in this game? I'm going to say, are they home? Yeah, they're home, right? Uh, I think so. I believe I they're yeah. home. I think so. Um, yeah, because Tampa's playing Calgary tonight, so they're away. There you go. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go with a 4-2 win, and I think uh, McDavid and Dryside are going to put their stamp on the game somehow. Oh, and I don't know why I said tonight, but it's actually the game's it's, on Saturday. It's Saturday, yeah. Saturday. It's late, yeah. the late game on Hockey Night in Canada, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there you go. Okay, but, so yeah, four two, that again, Julian. You think what? 4-2, 4-2 Oilers win because they're on home ice. I'll go with them. Um, and they played well against them the other time too. So, um, I, and I just think McDavid, one of McDavid or dry is going to have their stamp on the game. There you go. Brian, what about you? Uh, Oilers in overtime. Let's go four, three. I think the Oilers feel like they've got some oats against this team. Like they did a really good job against that Southeast road trip there with Carolina Tampa. Um, they did, they did play well. And I think they think they can win these games. Uh, if you get a boost, if, if Pugliarvi comes back, I think that's even more momentum for them. And I yep. think they want to win really badly. So I'm going to say that they do. I think it'll be close. Let's let's go. 
man, it's a tough, it's tough to score on Tampa. So let's go three, two. We'll say the Oilers win. I don't know that it goes to overtime. It'll be close though. Mm-hmm. I'm right down to the wire. I'm going to go three, two Oilers. Let's All think right. positively because they back need the Oilers, they need everybody. that win to get back in the playoffs. Back right? the Oilers to, on Saturday. There you go. All right, guys, <laughs> uh, that's going to do it for this week, but we've got the NHL trade line, trade deadline. Look real close. Uh, we're going to examine every position. We're going to examine everything they do before then, if they make any moves, and then what they might do uh, right before the 21st of March. So we'll do that next week. Thank you uh, for Julian, for Brian, for myself, Jim Parsons. It's been another edition of THW Oilers Overtime, and we will talk to you guys next week.